But uh, competition and monopoly <coughs> is, uh, is one of the really most interesting parts of, uh, of Austrian economics and how it differs from neoclassical economics and a lot of the applications of it that I've been interested in over the years of my own research on antitrust, for example. Uh, what, what, how the Austrians view competition has, uh, has a lot to say about antitrust policy and that is very different than what uh, mainstream economists, even, even Chicago School, free, quote, free market economists, have to say about, about such things as antitrust. And so what I want to do uh, in, the, in the short hour that I have, and I'll try to leave 10 minutes or so uh, for questions at the end, is uh, talk about some differences between uh, the Austrian view of competition versus uh, what you might call the neoclassical or, or mainstream view. And so I've written down just a basic definition. This is my definition of competition, the way Austrians think of competition as a, a dynamic, meaning ongoing, you know, always ongoing, rivalrous, rivalry meaning what the, the person on the street thinks of rivalry, <coughs> price cutting, differentiating your product, doing whatever it is to outsell your competitor. That's rivalry. Discovery process. The process, it's, the competition is a process, an ongoing process, and businesses are constantly discovering new ways to, to bring products to their consumers uh, that hopefully, from their perspective, will give them an edge up on the competition. Uh, and it facilitates plan coordination. It puts together buyers and sellers, it puts together uh, uh, producers and input suppliers and so forth the, uh, among all the market participants. And so that's basically a, a, a general definition of competition in the Austrian tradition. It's a dynamic, rivalrous discovery process, involves entrepreneurship, and facilitates plan coordination. <coughs> and the, the uh, neoclassical or, uh, theory of, uh, of competition is, is a very different. And uh, this definition, this, this way of thinking about competition prevailed from at least the time of Adam Smith until about the 1930s and 40s. And there was a, 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 the, a, the mathematical revolution in economics that had been occurring changed the definition of competition. Um, markets themselves didn't change, but the way in which economists thought about markets changed. So all of a sudden, economists in the US anyway, looking at uh, markets, in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, all of a sudden saw monopoly everywhere, even though the markets themselves were basically the same as they were 10 years earlier or 20 years earlier. And, and of course, the new theory of competition that was created to, uh, that was amenable to uh, mathematical modeling, unlike the earlier one, has, you know, is based on the, uh, a number of assumptions that you've all seen if you studied principles of microeconomics and it was, it was, it was a, a model of perfect competition. And what would a perfect or idealized competitive world look like? Many firms, whatever many is, producing, all producing the same thing, homogeneous products. They all have perfect information about what the consumers want how to, and how to produce it at the least cost manner, and how to get, get it to them. And uh, costless or free entry and exit. Those are the main ones. There are other assumptions and other textbooks that you look at, but those are the main assumptions of the, the so-called perfect competition model. And so uh, probably one of the best articles, one of my favorite articles uh, on the Austrian <coughs> theory of competition is in a little book called uh, Individualism and Economic Order, e edited by Friedrich Hayek, and it's called Comp uh, The Meaning of Competition. Uh, it's, and Hayek is kind of hard to read. His writing style was, uh, I've always found to be kind of convoluted. But there's, a lot of, uh, but there's a lot of great stuff in this one little article, The Meaning of Competition, if you want to understand the Austrian view. Uh, and the best book I could recommend on this is Antitrust and Monopoly by Dominic Armentano on the whole issue of competition and monopoly from the Austrian uh, tradition. In addition to, uh, of course, Man, Economy, and State, uh, uh, read the chapter on monopoly and on man economy and state. And that's, that's another, you know, if you want to read more than you can just hear about today. And so uh, what I'm going to talk about basically is the differences between these two definitions. And uh, this second definition, defining competition as some sort of perfectionist ideal, is uh, essentially 
what uh, the economist Harold Demsetz uh, from UCLA, I think he's retired since, labeled many years ago as uh, the nirvana fallacy. Looking at competition like this induces you to commit what he calls the nirvana fallacy. That is, what the fallacy is, is you set up some unrealistic and never achievable ideal and you compare the real world to that and you say, aha, the real world is a failure. It needs to be corrected by government because it's not perfect. But of course, nothing on earth is perfect. And so it is a built-in mechanism for condemning all market activity at all times and recommending perfect government as the solution. Okay, and, and, uh, and so for many decades, the same criterion was not applied to government. Uh, it was assumed that there's this perfect ideal of markets, and if markets fall short of that, the government needs to force them into it. But this was never applied to government. There was no perfect ideal of government, and if government falls short of it, well, we need to, you know, we need to force the go government somehow. That, that was not that was not done by uh, microeconomists. Uh, something like that did happen with what's called the public choice revolution in economics, which uh, was the application of economics to the study of political decision making, and it came up with a whole theory of government failure. So we do have that now, but the, the industrial organization economists, the micro theorists, uh, they never did this in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, in the heyday of, of the research on the, the perfect competition model. And so, uh, and to give you some uh, brief examples, of this, you know, I, I went upstairs and dug up a, a couple of uh, um, popular textbooks uh, on, on competition, see what they have to say about competition. And uh, <clears throat> the textbook by William Baumel and Alan Blinder, which is a very widely used textbook, uh, they lay out these definitions and then they say this the, about these uh, assumptions. These are obviously exacting requirements that are met infrequently in practice. Okay, and so uh, it is under perfect competition that the market mechanism performs best. So if we want to learn what markets do well, we can put the market's best foot forward by beginning with this, but it's very rare. You know, they say it's very rare to have these conditions met. Another book that's very popular by uh, Case and Fair, Carl Case and Ray Fair, they list these assumptions and they say, but these assumptions do not always hold in the real world markets. Gee whiz, that's my, my wording, gee whiz. When this, in this case, the conclusion that free, unregulated markets will produce an efficient outcome breaks down. And so unless you have everybody producing exactly the same thing, charging exactly the same price, and, and just um, um, a multitude of firms and costless entry and exit, markets are not efficient. They break down. They need regulation of some kind. And uh, you know, for many decades, the uh, the... Uh, Americans, as well as most others in the world who studied economics, studied it with uh, this textbook by Paul Samuelson, or some clone of Paul Samuelson, like the one by uh, Campbell, uh, uh, or, yeah, Campbell McConnell, Campbell McConnell. Uh, and so uh, this is a 1976 edition. This first came out in 1948. And from 48 until about the 1980s, this was the number one seller of uh, principles of economics books. And uh, it's kind of funny for me to look at it now, but there's a, there's a table here uh, in the book that's uh, on types of competition. It lists perfect competition, monopoly, and other things. And, uh, and, it, and it has a, a column that says, part of the economy where it's prevalent, competition. And all he has under uh, competition is a few agricultural industries. That's it. Everything else is monopolistic. And of course, if it's monopolistic, that means the government needs to, in Samuelson's view anyway, needs to step in and do something about that. Make it, make it more, more uh, uh, competitive. And uh, another book that's sort of a classic on antitrust and monopoly is one uh, written by, you, you, some, many of you probably know who Robert Bork is or something about who this guy Robert Bork is. He was nominated for the Supreme Court about 20 years ago, I guess. And, uh, but he was a law professor at Yale for many years, and he wrote a book called The Antitrust Paradox. And he was quite a well-known uh, antitrust economist, as well as a lawyer and a legal scholar. And uh, my favorite line in this book, The Antitrust Paradox, is where Bork said that if the government actually tried to uh, force the conditions of perfect competition on the U.S. economy, 
it would have roughly the same effect on national wealth as several strategically placed nuclear explosions. And, and, uh, and he was pretty much right about that. Now, uh, let me look at some of these, uh, some of these assumptions. If you look at them a little closer, many firms. Uh, where did this come from? Well, I've, I've studied this, uh, the history of how economists have looked at competition and have published on it. And uh, what I found is that uh, at the turn of the century, in the, in the late 1900s in the, U, in the U.S., there was a big merger wave uh, and that was occurring. Uh, but the economists at the time looked at all these mergers, meaning in, in many industries there were fewer and fewer firms uh, because, and, and bigger and bigger firms uh, operating there. Uh, but the economists who looked at this said, uh, this is a good thing. This is a natural evolution of, uh, of industry because they saw that these bigger firms, what were they doing? They were achieving lower and lower and lower cost through economies of scale by spreading the cost out over a larger scale, cost of advertising, distribution, production. And most of these lower costs were being passed on to the consumer in the form of higher prices. So the, the late 19th century economists who were looking at this uh, first big uh, merger wave in American history uh, thought, this is great. Uh, Everything is getting cheaper. There's more of it. Uh, they saw things like uh, the average person who bought beef had to buy it from sort of the mom and pop uh, meat monopoly in town. But then the so-called big four meat packers centralized their operations in Chicago and they figured out how to ship dressed beef in refrigerated train cars all over the place. So all of a sudden, the mom and pop meat monopolies had competition in town and families could buy meat cheaper. You had John D. Rockefeller uh, driving the cost of refined kerosene, which is how people heated and lit their homes for the most part, down to near nothing so that ordinary working people could uh, very cheaply buy heat and light their homes. And, and the economists of the time looked at this and they said, well, that's great. Look what's happening. Uh, this all, so, so bigness per se was not a problem. It was, it was leading to good things. Uh, this all changed, of course, later. It changed later when, as I said earlier, the markets didn't change, but the economist's definition of a perfect market changed. All of a sudden, many firms is required. And so they looked at the same things, such as Rockefeller's relentless driving down of cost and prices and said, this is a bad thing because there are fewer firms out there, per se. Okay. Um, and I've done some research on the 19th century trust, too. And uh, one of the things I found is that this was generally true of all of them. What, what Rockefeller was doing was being done uh, everywhere, almost just about everywhere. And uh, I'll give you one example of what I found in some of my own uh, research here. Let's see, I'm, I'm quoting from my own book, How Capitalism Saved America, which uh, you're all required to purchase before leaving Auburn, Alabama. <laughs> we'll, we'll be checking you at the door to make sure you have a copy. Um, I did a, a research project that was published in the International Review of Law, Law and Economics some years ago on uh, the trusts, so-called, that were being accused of monopolizing American industry at the, in the late 19th century. Because this phenomenon, there, there were bigger and bigger firms and there were fewer and fewer firms in many industries. But if you look at what counts to the consumer, that is, are products more widely available or less widely available, and are they cheaper or more expensive? Uh, just by the standards of neoclassical economics in terms of output or production, I found that um, uh, real gross national product increased for the decade before the Sherman Antitrust Act, which was 1890 by about 24%. So the economy in the U.S. grew by about 24% from 1880 to 1890. But those industries that were supposedly restricting output according to the, the mainstream view of uh, monopoly increased, actually increased production by 175%, many times faster than the economy as a whole. So these were the fastest growing uh, industries. And also, uh, they were the most uh, vigorous price-cutting industries. I found the same sort of thing in terms of uh, prices. They were all, uh, this was a period of deflation in U.S. economic history, uh, so the, uh, but uh, so-called. But um, uh, the prices charged by the so-called trusts were falling even faster 
than the average, the average prices in, in the U.S. economy. And so economies of scale is what was going on with mergers. When two firms merge, they generally uh, do so because they believe there's some sort of synergy that will enable them to cut their costs or improve the product that they're selling and get an edge up on the competition. Uh, but there are all sorts of ominous sounding theories of mergers. And one of them that was popular some years ago was called the domino theory of mergers. And it's sort of ominous, you know, the domino, once the domino, once those dominoes start falling, uh, we're all gonna fall off the, the end of the earth or something like that, oh, the domino effect. That was, that justified the Vietnam War, didn't it? The domino effect. And, uh, but what the domino effect of mergers is, is an observation that during historical episodes, there seems to be, uh, say you had an industry with 20 firms and two of them merge, then sure enough, you'll see two more merge and then two more and then two more. And before long, there's only five firms left in that industry. And a domino effect, and this <coughs> is something to be feared. But basically what is happening here is you start out with these 20 firms, two of them figure out that maybe one of them is really good at production. It has the best engineers in the industry working for it, but it has bad marketing. It's just, just not good at selling. Another firm has mediocre engineers and engineering, but it has the top flight marketing team. It's hired some of the best talent in the country. Uh, and so if they combine, they become more competitive because they have the best engineering and the best marketing. And uh, they succeed. Other firm, and, and <coughs> succeed meaning they take business away from the other 18. And so the other 18, they have to get to work and figure out, well, how can we compete better with these, this new firm? Merger is one, one possible means. And so you see the, the, the stimulus to a lot of this is usually competition, lower prices, lower costs. And you have, to, you have to figure out a way to reconfigure your business in a way that will make you more competitive in, in terms of better products and or lower prices. And so if you look at the, uh, the outcome of all these, these domino effects, invariably you'll see the result to the consumer is lower prices, even though there are fewer firms, which is in conflict with that definition of the perfect, uh, perfect competition model. Uh, an, another aspect of uh, uh, this many firms uh, and the attack on mergers that comes from it is uh, there's been some research also in economics that looks at mergers and says, well, it is true that there was one study by uh, two economists named Scherer, Frederick Scherer and David Sheffman, that looked at hundreds and hundreds of mergers over uh, several decades in U.S. history. I think it was around 700 or so um, merger, corporate mergers. And they found that more than half of them were spun off uh, within 10 years or so. That is, they sold, they sold the part of the business that they had previously acquired. So in other words, the merger didn't work out. It didn't make them more competitive. And so from that, they conclude that uh, we need more government regulation of mergers to stop these mergers that don't work out. And of course, that assumes that government regulators have some sort of omniscience, and they can see 10 years down the road of what <laughs> may or may not work, even when they have no, none of their own personal money at stake which I always found to be absolutely preposterous, but these are some very smart guys, uh, uh, PhD economists with long publication records, Scherer, he's, he's probably near, nearing retirement if he's not retired now, but he taught at Harvard for many years and his textbook was the textbook in industrial organization for several decades. But the Austrian view of this phenomenon would be that uh, you might remember that definition where I, one of the words I had in there was discovery process that there is no recipe for the optimal organization of a business or an industry. This is something that is discovered by trial and error by business people. And mergers is one way of discovering what works best. And if it doesn't work, well then we learn. It didn't work. And, so, and we learn what works by looking, observing what doesn't work. And so the only way to know what the optimal configuration of an industry is, the optimal size uh, of a business you know, within an industry, is to try it, trial and error. Uh, because there's no central planner or economic expert or government official who could possibly have this knowledge. The market process reveals this knowledge to us. That's how we get this knowledge. But you remember in that perfect competition model, this knowledge is assumed to exist. It's perfect information. So the very knowledge that markets produce 
is assumed to exist in the minds of some expert by the perfect competition model, which uh, is simply absurd. But that's the model. That's what's that's been all, it's always it's still in the textbooks. But uh, so that's one other difference. Another another point about mergers is the whole attack on mergers and smaller number of firms is called industrial concentration. Really does ignore international trade. So what? There are only three or four car companies in the U.S. that sell a lot of cars. There's a lot of competition from abroad. So keep that in mind. That that international com not only international competition but potential competition is ignored when you when you talk in terms of monopoly in terms merely in terms of uh, market concentration that is how many num how many firms there are selling you know what percentage of the sales if anybody really is making a lot of money uh, yeah, what, uh, and uh, it's going to attract competition from all over the world uh, and so uh, and that always has to be taken into consideration. Okay, and so that's what I want to say about uh, many firms, and, and all kinds of mischief has been done because you have to understand if the government comes in and breaks up uh, uh, a corporation because it thinks it's too big and has too much market share, if the reason for that bigness is efficiency and low prices, then that is uh, unequivocally harmful to the consumers because they're forced to pay higher prices. If, if the cause of the the success and the bigness of the firm is low prices. Uh, you break it up, you'll cause them to be less efficient. And that's why in, in, uh, in terms of the political reasons for um, anti-monopoly regulation, antitrust regulation, invariably it's the, the, least, uh, the less efficient firms who urge the regulators to bring a lawsuit, an antitrust lawsuit against the more efficient competitor. Uh, in the U.S., over 90% of all the antitrust lawsuits are private lawsuits. One rival suing another uh, for something. Now, if your rival really is acting like a monopoly and raising prices, that's what monopolies do, would you sue him? Would you want the government to sue him to stop him from raising his price? Of course not. That would be ridiculous. You would say, go to it, because you could either raise your price too or keep your price about where it is and take more market share away from him because you're underpricing. And so it's only when your competitor is dropping his price or improving his product or both that you will see an antitrust lawsuit, either a private lawsuit or, uh, or urging of the government to sue on your behalf and on the behalf of you and other rivals. Uh, that's generally what happens. Okay. Now let's take a look second at the homogeneous products assumption uh, here. The basic difference here, uh, you know, I guess the reason for this assumption originally in the model is that uh, it was claimed that the perfect competition model was a model of price competition primarily. And so these assumptions were meant to uh, subtract out all these other uh, variables like product differentiation so that the model could focus on what happens to price when cost and demand changes over time. And that can be a useful exercise with the, the model, the competitive model. However, uh, that was the original meaning of the model. Okay, let's, let's just hold these things constant, product differentiation, and, and vary demand and cost and see what happens to price. Okay, but economists over the years have taken these assumptions far too seriously as a benchmark of competition. And uh, one example is uh, is how so, some economists, uh, there's a famous uh, uh, antitrust case called the Serials case. Some of you may have studied if you ever took a course in industrial organization, the Serials case, as in breakfast cereal. This was in the late 1970s in the U.S. And there were three companies, uh, General Mills, Kellogg's, and General Foods, that began experimenting with all sorts of different brands of cereal. Uh, and this was about, at the time in the U.S., this was about the time when people started becoming more health conscious. So they started uh, make, uh, offering all kinds of brands of granola and things like that. And Count Chocula, which is probably the most healthy cereal you can get, I think, <laughs> uh, that, that sort of thing. And, uh, and some of these brands failed. I can remember going to the grocery store where there would be uh, shelves and shelves and shelves of cereal you never heard of that people didn't like. You could buy for uh, 50 cents a box or something like that that just didn't work out. 
Uh, but some of them really caught on, and these three companies just made a, a lot of money, and they ended up getting, uh, I think, a 90% of the, the dry cereal market among these three companies. Um, and there were many other companies, but they did not invest all the money that it would take to invest in the marketing and, and experimentation and coming up with these new products. And so they fell behind. They lost the sales. And so the Federal Trade Commission in the United States, uh, which regulates, uh, supposedly regulates monopoly, uh, sued these companies for having what they called a shared monopoly. Shared monopoly. Uh, monopoly in the textbook definition is a single firm, single so It wasn't a single, it was three of them. But so they invented this new theory of shared monopoly and uh, sued them for it. And of course, when you're sued by the government for something like this, even if you win the lawsuit, you lose because it costs you many millions of dollars and, and, and you have to divert uh, management from running the business to worrying about dealing with the government and the lawyers and you have to hire lawyers and, and so forth. And I have friends who have worked at the Federal Trade Commission and they've told me about some lawsuits where day after day after day, the biggest U-Haul truck you can rent filled to the ceiling with uh, file boxes would pull up to the back door of the Federal Trade Commission because the, the FTC would demand all paperwork, of all memos, any, everything of any kind by some company. So the company would have to send literally uh, many, many tons of paper to, uh, to Washington, D.C. that would have an army of lawyers read every word of it trying to find one line there that could incriminate the company in breaking some sort of law. And so the company has to deal with this. They have to do all these things, which takes all their attention away from their, their business. And of course, that's exactly what the competitors want them to do. Uh, exactly. And so, the, uh, but what was the theory behind this? The theory was that behind it was that brand proliferation or product differentiation was the source of this so-called monopoly. Yeah, because after all, the, the perfect competition model says homogeneous products are a hallmark of, of competition, and so we should be suspicious of differentiation. <coughs> and so they came up with this theory. It turned out that uh, the cereal companies won the case after several years of being wound up in, in court. But like I said, even when you win, you lose because it costs you many millions of dollars, and, and there's no way of measuring objectively uh, the lost time that management had to spend dealing with this as opposed to dealing with selling cereal and or improving cereal products. Uh, basically, the judge had some common sense in the, in the case, and I think there was this uh, famous remark that he made that uh, to the effect that I don't even like cereal. The judge, you know, even if they were charging high prices for their cereal, well, we could all shift to uh, bagels and muffins and bacon and eggs. You know, so there are a lot of substitutes for dry cereal for breakfast foods. So this business of a monopoly is uh, is nonsense. So that, that was actually one good decision by the courts uh, there. And um, the handout that I gave you is uh, is from the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas annual report. Uh, was it 1997? It says on there 1998. It's a, a study. It's a study of a phenomenon known as mass customization. And basically what it is is some real interesting statistics about the effects of the combination of computer technology and manufacturing technology over the past 20, 25 years that has enabled businesses to tailor their products in many, many different ways to the, the growing diversity of preferences that consumers have. It's well known among marketing experts that as societies become more affluent, uh, consumers' tastes become more flighty. They change more often. And so in a competitive environment, you would expect successful businesses to adapt to that. If, if there are rapidly changing preferences, if you want to make money and if you want to stay in business, you have to adapt too. You have to change your products to meet what the people want. And I thought this would be an interesting example, you know, many examples, of the, uh, the expanded variety of all sorts of products from automobiles to airports to beer to even uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken menu items have doubled during, during this time period uh, here. And so uh, the, the point I want to make here is that in, in diametric opposition to the assumption that homogeneous products are necessarily a good thing for competition, just the, just the opposite, that in as, as the economy has been, the world economy has become more and more competitive, we've seen a, 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 an extreme proliferation in brands of all sorts. 
from blue jeans to cars to, to soft drinks, everything, and that's a good thing. Uh, you, would, you would want a competitive economy where businesses are striving to uh, give the best deal to the customers to, to look like this, and that's exactly what it looks like. Uh, in years past, though, uh, the, in another one of the revolutions, it's one of the true revolutions in economics, we had the, the Keynesian revolution in the 30s, and also in the 30s we had the monopolistic competition revolution, uh, where the basic idea was that uh, with product differentiation, just about every product is a monopoly, even if there's many firms producing it, because if you define it narrowly enough, it is a single seller. You know, if uh, the only one person sells this exact shirt, I suppose, and nobody else sells the exact same design, they're a lot like it, and so every shirt manufacturer is a monopolist, supposedly. And th that was the kind of thinking that came from Joan Robinson and Edward and Chamber Chamberlain, two uh, British economists. But I think uh, reality uh, proves them wrong about that. Um, now, the next assumption, perfect information, uh, this assumption has, has fueled, has given sort of intellectual weight for many years to all the various criticisms of advertising. Because after all, if, if an ideal market has perfect information, there's no need for advertising. Everyone's assumed to know what the product is. Uh, and there's, there's, there's long been a theory of advertising as a barrier to entry in the business. Uh, the, the thinking basically goes that if... Uh, if a company has to spend a lot of money on advertising because <coughs> the incumbents, the firms that already exist, spend huge amounts of money on advertising, then that's a barrier because they have to not only come up with the product, but with the many millions of dollars to spend on advertising to compete with the incumbent firms that are, that are already there. And it's, uh, it's kind of a seductive theory to, uh, to a lot of people because it is a, you know, it's a big expense as far as that goes. Uh, but uh, that ignores also how advertising really is and always has been a competitive device. You can't sell anything if people don't know about it. And so uh, a part of this ongoing dynamic struggle for business is advertising. You could have the best pizza in the world, but if your pizza joint is located behind a row of tall pine trees and no one knows you're there, it really doesn't matter that you have the best pizza in the world. You have to advertise. You have to at least put up a sign so that people know you're, you're there. And, uh, and of course, there's a lot of frivolous sounding advertisement. It doesn't seem particularly informational. Uh, you might have the Swedish bikini team selling beer, or something like that. And most people think, well, that's a, what do we know about the beer? We just see the girls in the bikinis. And, and does that make you want to drink beer? I, uh, it does for most guys, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but uh, at least it tells you the product is out there. You know, it tells you it, it, that's that's the information you get. The product is out there, and uh, also it's it might be persuasive because people sort of kind of like it if it's a cute or funny advertisement. That uh, when they like that the one with the duck, the Aflac duck that you've seen on television is kind of stupid, isn't it? The Yogi Berra talking to a duck on a as those of you who have seen this on American television. Uh, but, you know, who knew that there was an insurance company called Aflac uh, two years ago? And that's, nobody knew about that. And so uh, even though it seems silly, it, it tells you we're in town. Try us out. Look, go on our website. See what our rates are. And, of course, that is a good thing for competition. Imagine uh, if, if there was a total ironclad ban on um, advertising for automobile tires, let's say. What would you have to do to buy new tires for your car? Most of us would shop around for something like that because the tires cost a lot of money for, for cars. But if there was an ironclad ban on radio, television, newspaper, advertising, what would you have to do if you wanted to shop around and you just didn't want to get ripped off? By, uh, well, you'd have to drive around. You'd have to go to one place and a second place that sold tires. And, uh, and more likely, the average person would only maybe make two stops uh, as far as that goes. And the businesses would know this. They would know it's tougher for you to shop around if, if there's an ironclad ban on their advertising. And they would charge higher prices as a result. And, uh, and so, uh, and there's been a lot of research on this actually, on uh, legislative bans on advertising. That's why lawyers and doctors for many years uh, had succeeded in getting bans on advertising. It's unsavory to, uh, 
to, to advertise uh, for your legal services, they said, unprofessional. <coughs> and uh, they would even uh, drop people off the rolls of the um, local bar associations if they took out ads advertising, you know, divorce, two, buy one, get the second one 50% off or something, <laughs> uh, whatever lawyer, however lawyers advertise. Uh, but that, that has been deregulated for the most part. So lawyers and doctors now, uh, now advertise. You see, uh, go to Miami and you, you open up the newspaper and there's plastic surgery ads everywhere, and it's, uh, uh, and among other things. Uh, and so they know it's cheaper. Uh, some years ago, um, Holiday Inns, the corporation, Holiday Inns, joined with some environmentalist organizations like the Sierra Club in lobbying for uh, uh, restrictions, if not outright bans, on roadside billboard advertising. And so the, the environmentalists thought, well, well you know what's, what's in it for them. They, billboards are ugly. They want to look at trees. They don't want to look at billboards. And so a Holiday Inn thought that, well, we could be good corporate citizens, socially responsible by beautifying the American countryside. What could be um, less, more patriotic than that? But, of course, the real hidden motive on the part of Holiday Inns was, was they have a brand name. Everybody knows you, what, about what you're going to get if you stop at a Holiday Inn. It's, it's a pretty decent quality hotel, moderate price, swimming pool filled with uh, loud, noisy kids and all sorts of nasty stuff in the pool and you know you, so you know what about what you're going to get but uh you know you might not want all that you might not want to pay uh, you know motel six could come around and say clean bed clean shower 19 dollars uh, and then get out of here you know we don't have a band we don't have a bar uh no breakfast uh 19 bucks so you want a good night's sleep in a clean room that's what you get but if you don't know they're there you're riding down the interstate and there's no billboard saying $19 for a room, you know, you're more likely to just stop at what you know, the Holiday Inn or something similar. And so, uh, so uh, Holiday Inn was using its brand name advantage to try to use ban, a ban on advertising to reduce competition. And in general, bans or restrictions on advertising will do that. They'll reduce competition because advertising <coughs> is, a, is a competitive device. Um, uh, in, in the history of economics, there is a, a false separation in some of the literature between production versus selling costs. Uh, it was said that, well, production costs, of course, are necessary to produce things, but, but much of selling costs, advertising costs, are not necessary. But the truth is, every, all costs are selling costs. The whole purpose of being a business is to sell and to make money to sell. And so it it's really is a false distinction between uh, production costs and selling costs. All costs are selling costs. That's, that's why you produce to sell, and so. But this was also used to sort of uh, criticize uh, advertising or selling uh, costs and, and urge government regulation of it. And uh, one final thing I'd mention about advertising here and information is there was a probably the most famous critic of advertising is John Kenneth Galbraith, who uh, George Reisman I think mentioned, or was it Ralph? Ra no, it was Ralph Rako who mentioned him in his talk the opening night. And uh, he's, he's, he's written several books with all the same theme. And in fact, all his books have bear pretty much basically the same theme, theme is that uh, we all have too much money in our pockets and the government has too little of it. That's basically Galbraith's theme in all his big fat books that, he, that he's written. And one of the key elements of his theory, of his thinking, is that advertising is a major culprit here. Uh, he, calls it, he calls it the dependence effect, uh, allegedly advertisers persuade you to buy things that you don't really need. And if they didn't do that, you would have more money to give to the government that will supply you with things you really do need. And uh, he, he coined the famous phrase, uh, private affluence amidst public squalor. You know, government is, uh, the government housing projects and the schools and fire departments are just in squalor because they don't have enough money. And here we are, you know, you know, buying all this stuff, and we, and we don't need all this money. That's basically Galbraith's uh, line. And uh, Friedrich Hayek uh, took him on seriously in an article that was published around 1960, I think it was, in the Southern Economic Journal, and it was called The Non Sequitur of the Dependence Effect. And among the things Hayek said, said here was that, okay, Galbraith's basic thesis is, uh, is, is basically that uh, the only legitimate expenses are, are, are on things that are 
the uh, what he called innate needs. Innate needs. Everything else, things that are brought to your attention by advertisers, are not innate. They're 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 fabrications. So you don't need to spend your money on the on these sorts of things. Now think about that. The only legitimate expenses of, out of your pocket are the things that come out of your mind, your your innate needs. What does that say about the value of John Kenneth Galbraith's <coughs> books? <laughs> they're, they're worthless, right? Because you didn't think of them. They're not innate coming out of your mind. What does that say about the value of all art and literature in general? It's worthless because they're not innate out of your mind. You should not buy, ever buy a piece of art or a book because uh, you didn't think of it. It didn't come out of your mind. Some, some publisher or some art gallery brought it to your attention. And so Hayek points out that the only genuinely innate needs are uh, food, shelter, and sex. Everything else is brought to your attention by somebody. And so, uh, so he called it non sequitur means it does not follow logically. And so, so Hayek really tore apart the so-called dependence effect. But Galbraith still keeps writing it, and uh, his followers do. Other people, is, in a lot of universities and business schools even, uh, it's sort of an assume, assumption that this is this is a, a, a truth. Um, all I'll say about freedom of entry and exit is that uh, it assumes a zero opportunity cost. If you take this word free literally, and it means uh, there's no scarcity, which is the basic assumption of all of economics. It's just scarcity exists. That's why we have to make choices. And that's why there's such a thing as opportunity cost. But if you, you liter if you take it literally, free entry and exit, it means there is no opportunity cost to entering or exiting businesses, which, which is uh, very odd indeed. The major form of barriers to, to competition have always been government-imposed barriers, protectionism, government franchise monopolies, regulations that make it very expensive to get into a business. That, that's the main source of entry barriers. Now, now Murray Rothbard, uh, I would urge all of you to read his chapter of Man, Economy, and State on, on uh, monopoly. And he makes some very cogent points that you, you won't find in the, your typical mainstream uh, microeconomics book about, about this. But uh, they're very logical and very well thought out and, and true, I think. And one of them is, you know, most economists, including free market economists, uh, talk a lot about consumer sovereignty. And we generally think it's a good thing if we have an economy that is driven by the consumer. Von Mises in Human Action has a great passage, I didn't bring it with me, about how, when, you know, even though the bankers and the business people make the day-to-day -day decisions on what gets produced and who gets it, where it gets sold at, it's really the consumer that is pulling all the strings. Because if the consumers won't buy this stuff, it doesn't matter what the bankers do or what the business people do. You could have all the bankers in the world deciding at one time that the lead tennis ball industry is where to put our money. But if the consumers don't want to pay, play tennis with lead tennis balls, it doesn't matter that they're making the day-to-day -day decisions. They're bad decisions. So, so it is true, consumer sovereignty is a real thing, an important part of the economy. But Murray Rothbard said that we should think more in terms of self-sovereignty and not consumer sovereignty. It's an important aspect of our economy that it really is driven by the consumers, not the capitalists and the bankers and the financiers, but the consumers, but self-sovereignty. Now, why did he say this? Uh, he said this because there's a bias in economics in favor of consumers and against producers for no good reason. Um, for example, uh, if, if producers uh, are said to restrict output, that is, produce a level of output that's less than some ideal, the perfectly competitive ideal, uh, that is said to supposedly harm the consumer. Okay, but, um, you know, Murray brought up the question, well, I guess he would say, well, so what? Uh, what why is it necessarily immoral for someone to voluntarily say, I only want to sell 100 television sets in my store. I don't want to have 500 television sets for sale in my store. Why is that immoral? Uh, and and do a, uh, worthy of condemnation and government crackdowns on that. If someone wants to voluntarily do that, the consumer is perfectly free to do business with me or not. He can go somewhere else. But if I restrict my output by selling fewer rather than more things, uh, why am I not sovereign? 
and, and, and why do I not have that, that right to make that decision? And that's a good point. That's a good point. And, uh, and more along the lines of economic analysis here, that's sort of a philosophical point. But uh, Rothbard also pointed out that uh, the idea that output restriction can cause higher prices, monopoly prices, well, however you might define that, is only true if demand is inelastic. inelastic. That is, if uh, the percentage increase in the price, you, know, you drop your price, is, uh, is bigger than the percentage reduction in sales that you get as a result of the price increase. Uh, that's you know, one of the rules of thumb of microeconomics. You raise your price, if it's inelastic, revenue goes up. Okay. However, if this happens, you raise your price and demand is inelastic. If consumers then say, well, at that higher price, we're going elsewhere, that makes your demand more, e more elastic. Uh, that's, that's one of the determinants of elasticity of demand, ease of substitutability. So if the consumers go somewhere else, that makes your demand more elastic and thereby uh, foils your attempt to make more money by raising your price. And if the consumers don't go somewhere else, then that is evidence that they're pretty happy with your product. They're willing to pay more because they must see that there's some more value there to your product and they're willing to pay more. So, so either way, it's not, uh, it's not uh, an ominous cartel. That you, the same analysis goes for cartels, by the way. If a group of people uh, band together and decide to somehow <coughs> organize a higher price, it can only work with inelastic demand. And if the consumers go elsewhere, the demand becomes elastic, breaks up the whole cartel. Uh, it, it can't work. And so, uh, in fact, the whole history of attempts at cartel formation has been a history of businesses trying to form cartels. doesn't work. It might work for a short amount of time. Uh, and then they turn to government to enforce the cartel. And so you can't really have a real cartel without the, the coercive powers of government to keep it going. Some good examples of this are uh, the Civil Aeronautics Board, which regulated the American airline industry beginning in the 1920s. There were more airline companies in the 1930s in the U.S. than there were in the 1970s. That's all changed since then with deregulation. But one of the things the, uh, they did, the Civil Aeronautics Board did, was to enforce a cartel among the airline companies. They even set the prices. That's a pretty good deal. And uh, you people don't, uh, don't remember this. I don't know if you've ever even studied it. But uh, uh, we probably couldn't have Mises University if it was still under airline deregulation because it would be too expensive for most of the students to get here. The only real travelers were business people, mostly businessmen. We're talking about the 1960s and up through the mid-70s, whose uh, airfare was paid for by their, their companies for the most part. And the prices were set at monopolistic levels by the government, the Civil Aeronautics Board, and price competition was illegal. You, the airlines could not compete on price. And so they competed on uh, quality. And so if you flew uh, in the 1960s, all the stewardesses, they were not called flight attendants, they were called stewardesses because they were all female. There were no male uh, flight attendants back then. And they were all pretty much former playboy bunnies for the most part. And that's, that's how they competed. And the businessmen and, and free booze. Free booze and, and uh, women who looked like uh, uh, they just walked out of Hugh Hefner's mansion. That's pretty much how they competed. And so, uh, but that's all changed. That's all changed with, uh, with deregu deregulation of this. The trucking industry was the same thing. The Interstate Commerce Commission was a cartel operated for the trucking business. And it was eventually deregulated in the late 70s also. But the trucking industry tried and tried and failed to car cartelize. It ran to the government and succeeded for many decades. And uh, they, they set the prices of trucking services. And they had rules like if a, if a truck left Atlanta filled with furniture and drove to California to deliver the furniture, uh, by law, it had to come back from California empty. Uh, and of course, that's a way of sort of an underhanded way of reducing the supply of trucking services. Okay, and so, uh, and so that, and that was that's been deregulated too. It was one of, the, one of the few good things government has done in the U.S. over the past 30 years. Okay, uh, another aspect of this output restriction uh, story is that when you think about it, um, 
everybody restricts output. Where, where can this end? Um, why do professional baseball players only play 160 games a year? Why don't they play 1,600 games a year? They're restricting output. Look at those fat NFL players. They only play, what, 16 ball games a year? Big deal. They all make 10, 20 million dollars a year. Why don't we make them pay, play 160 football games a year? They're restricting output. Why do prize fighters only fight once or twice a year? Why, do, why doesn't the world heavyweight champion, why isn't he forced to fight every week? You know, did you ever see that movie Fight Club? Those guys, uh, Brad Pitt, he fought about every other night, didn't he? That, that, you can, it can do it. Uh, they're, restricting out, <laughs> they're restricting output. Uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of mocking all this, but I, I was at a conference, a conference held by the Cato Institute. Geez, this was, the conference was my idea, and it was uh, 1990, the 100th anniversary of the Sherman Act. It was on any trust, and, the, and I'll never forget, this is a long, 15 years ago, but there was a Federal Trade Commission economist there who was bragging about how they were protecting us from monopoly in that current era. And uh, one case uh, that sticks in my mind, he said it was about Detroit auto dealers. He said they were investigating them because it, it was the winter, and the Detroit auto dealers all shut down at around 6 p.m. It was downtown Detroit, 6 p.m. in the winter. Not the, not the ideal place to walk around shopping for cars, <laughs> test driving and, and everything. And, so if, and, and it's like a lot of cities in America, uh, when business hours are over, they become pretty much empty, the downtown, everybody goes home and there's not much, so there's not much business. It seems to me it'd make perfect sense for them to shut down and not pay the employees and not pay the electricity and everything it takes to stay open with no customers. But uh, the FTC was suspecting that this was a cartel arrangement where they, they all colluded and agreed to restrict output by shutting down at 6 p.m. And they were seriously considering forcing them to stay open until 9 o'clock. And so uh, the question I asked this guy was, does this mean forced labor is a prerequisite for economic efficiency? And the answer has to be yes, in his mind, that uh, slavery of some kind is necessary. I mean, what, what else would you call it if you tell somebody, you know, some man, I want to go home at 6 o'clock. It's my business. I own this franchise, this Toyota franchise. Or I guess it wouldn't be Toyota in downtown Detroit. I own this Chrysler franchise. I've decided I want to go home and have dinner at 6 o'clock. And the government says, no, you can't. You have to sit right there until 9 o'clock. <laughs> what is that? That's forced labor. And so it's... Uh, and the output restriction, in the name of efficiency, it said that if a business or an industry restricts output below the, uh, the optimum level, the efficient level, that creates an inefficient allocation of resources. However, as Rothbard pointed out, if you take a more general view of this, if, if a businesses did reduce uh, the level of production, the resources that they do not use, labor, capital, and so forth, will be used somewhere else. They'll be bid away. There's the people who are not employed are not going to commit suicide. They'll look for other jobs. And they'll be put in, in other industries altogether, most likely. And so there's going to be an, an expansion of output somewhere else. So if any one business or industry reduces output, well, yes, it reduces output there, and you can talk about inefficiencies that might be caused by that, or a reduction in consumer welfare, let's say. But there's an increase in consumer welfare and output somewhere else. And so if you take sort of a general equilibrium view of this, uh, uh, you can't even say that uh, any one industry that reduces output uh, has a bad effect on efficiency because you have to take into consideration what happens to those resources. Okay. And a few other things. Uh, I think I'll, I'll conclude by saying that um, historically monopoly has always been viewed, was always viewed as the source of monopoly as a grant by the state. And uh, free market monopoly only became a prevalent idea in America anyway, around the 1930s and 40s with the adoption of the perfect competition model. And antitrust itself has been a, a major source of, uh, of monopoly, as I mentioned earlier. And I'll leave you with this one quote from a famous uh, antitrust decision by uh, a judge named Judge Learned Hand, a perfect name for a judge. Learned, that's his real name, Learned Hand. And he's a Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court judge. And uh, uh, Alcoa, the, the Aluminum Company of America, was, uh, was accused of being a monopoly uh, in the 1950s. And Judge Hand 
uh, condemned them as being monopoly. And here's what he said. Even though, like all these other companies I mentioned earlier, they were dropping their prices. He said he condemned Alcoa, quote, for its superior skill, foresight, and industry, which was exclusionary. So it had superior foresight and, and the skill, and this excluded competitors. He said uh, uh, he condemned them for stimulating sales, and then once they did that, then, quote, efficiently supplying demand that it itself had evolved. So it, it had good advertising as well as good, mar good production, and uh, so, uh, so he condemned them for being good. He said Alcoa had doubled and redoubled its capacity to fill the demand and embraced every new opportunity with a great organization manned with elite business personnel. And, end quote. Therefore, they're guilty of monopolizing the aluminum business. And, and uh, you know, with, uh, with antitrust in the United States, when you're found guilty, if, if, if the uh, lawyers for the government make a case that you cause, say, the loss of a billion dollars in lost sales to your competitors, and maybe another billion dollars uh, to the consumers, that's two billion dollars, they have what are called treble damages, and the penalty would be six billion dollars triple whatever damage they decide you created by being a monopoly. I'm just making these numbers up. These are not the real Alcoa numbers, but, but treble damages is what you pay. And so uh, that's probably one of the all-time worst antitrust decisions, but there have been many others. Um, the government, uh, General Motors was famous in the 1950s and 60s of, of uh, instructing its, all its managers to make sure it never got more than a 45% market share. That is, don't make our cars too good or too cheap because we might get more than a 45% market share. And if we do that, the government will probably sue us for violating the antitrust laws and being a monopoly. And so, so that's, and I, I, I'm all about out of time. We have a few minutes, I guess, for a couple of quick questions, I guess. Yeah, question. Um, what do you think about patents and copyrights? Everybody always asks that. Uh, they're, uh, well, they're government-created monopolies. And I would recommend you read uh, the Journal of Libertarian Studies article by Stefan Kinsella. On, uh, on, uh, he's a patent lawyer and is uh, also uh, the book review editor of the Journal of Libertarian Studies. And uh, Murray Rothbard addresses it in Man, Economy, and State, too. But uh, they are government-created monopolies, uh, each of them. I think this man here had his hand up next. What's your opinion of natural monopoly? <laughs> I don't have a very high opinion of natural monopoly. Uh, you can read my opinion in the Review of Austrian Economics, 1996, uh, Volume 9, Number 2, which I have right here. I did a study of natural monopoly uh, some years ago and, uh, and found that, sure enough, you know, the theory was that uh, with economies of scale, uh, there, would, there would evolve in the market one big firm that would achieve economies of scale first before anybody else and therefore become a monopoly, therefore the government needed to regulate it. Uh, but what I found is the truth is this never happened. This is a fable and that there was a lot of competition in the public utilities, in the electricity, telephone, and everything else. And, uh, and this natural monopoly theory was used to justify government creation of monopolies. And uh, I'll just recommend that article, but I'll read you one thing. You know, that's yeah. probably all we'll have time for. Mark will get upset here. I don't want to. I don't want to upset Mark here so early in the morning. But there's a, a, an economist named Horace Gray who wrote a great article way back in 1940 in the Journal of Land and Public Utility Economics. It's called <laughs> the Journal of Land Economics now. And, uh, and this summarizes what I found in my article. He says, during the 19th century, it was widely believed that the public interest would be best promoted by grants of special privilege to corporations in many industries. This included patents, subsidies, tariffs, and land grants to railroads. Uh, with regard to the public utilities, between 1907 and 1938, the policy of state-created, state-protected monopoly became firmly established over a significant portion of the economy and became the keystone of modern public utility regulation. From that time on, the public utility status was to be the haven of refuge for all aspiring monopolists who found it too difficult, too costly, or too precarious to secure and maintain monopoly by private action alone, and, uh, and, uh, end quote. And what I found was that in the telephone industry, there were, in some cities, were dozens of competitors. 
electric utilities in the United States. There have always been cities with multiple competitors. Cable TV, the same way. All these industries that were supposedly monopolies had vigorous competition, and there wasn't a natural monopoly coming about. A monopoly was created by government fiat. The AT&T monopoly was created by the federal government after World War I. The, go the U.S. government mon uh, nationalized all the telephone services during World War I. Then after the war, they let the states uh, have telephone monopolies, and through lobbying and politicking, uh, AT&T persuaded the federal government to give it the, the, telephone, the telephone monopoly. But before World War I, there was vigorous competition in the tele telephone industry, and then we ended up with, uh, what, uh, 80 years of mon government franchise monopoly and telephone services as a result. And there was nothing natural about it. It was government imposed. I guess we're out of time. We're out of time.